Well, if you're glad to be in church, say amen this morning. Well, boy, I'll tell you, y'all can settle down then. That was too much. I said, if you're glad to be in church, say amen. All right. Well, we're glad to see you too, boy. If you're a first-time guest here at Liberty, we want to especially welcome you and thank you for being here. Maybe I shook your hand in the parking lot. My name's Matt Burrell. I am the lead pastor here. It's my privilege to be able to preach this morning, and uh, we're thankful that you're here today, and uh, we hope that you enjoy your time with us this morning. If you're a first-time guest, you could do us a great favor by taking that connection card that's in the chair in front of you and filling out whatever information you'd feel comfortable putting on there. It helps an old guy like me be able to remember your name and put a name with a face. I promise you we won't spam you and we won't uh, worry you to death, but we just want to have a record that you were here and uh, get to know you by knowing your name and, and, and where you're from. And so we just thank you for being here. We're so thankful that you're in Liberty today. Today we begin, or we continue preaching on uh, the supernatural church and we've been preaching a sermon series on that about the things that it takes to become a supernatural church there's so many things in our life uh, that we could be for God if we would turn ourselves into the way God wants us to be and we could achieve some great things for God and one of the things that we want to achieve and some of the things that God has dealt with my heart and in my life and for our church I believe is this compassion experience this compassion experience is coming in the 15th of November and it runs through the 18th it is an opportunity for you to leave the country without leaving the country. They'll set up a 2,000 square foot building here that will mock and mimic uh, a, a foreign country and it will tell the story of what Jesus Christ has done in two individuals' lives. And so we're excited about it and we want you to be as well. But at this time, we've got a video to show you what it'll somewhat, like, uh, somewhat be like. My name is Jay. Come with me on a journey to Nairobi, Kenya. I want to show you my life. I live in the Madare slum in Nairobi, Kenya. It's remarkable. Having been in Africa, this feels so authentic. You see everything from the food they eat to the clothes they wear. It feels like you're there. This is my new home. It is a prison. He got thrown in jail and he was nine years old. He was just a kid. My son is 10. <laughs> so we can identify. Wow. If my son was there, what, what would I feel? What would I do? And then imagine what his mom was feeling. You walk out of that prison almost out of hope, and then you walk into hope. This is my compassion center. Compassion is helping me pay for school, medicine, and health care. And everyone started cheering for him. It made me so happy. We all like looked at each other and like paused it. We're like, yay! It doesn't only show you reality. It shows you how you can change reality. I can actually do something. I can actually make a difference. The first time I heard the words "I love you" was from my sponsor. I got to hear that God loved me. They introduced me to Jesus. I want to show you my life. Come with me to Nairobi. I want to show you my life. Come with me to Nairobi. And so for more information on our Compassion Experience, you can go to our website, and you can go and register for a time to come and experience a 20-minute tour of this. And we would encourage every one of our church members to come to it, be a part of that. And then also we need volunteers, people who would volunteer with the setup, the teardown, and then the hosting the event. And you can register for that at the same website. There's a place to register to visit and then a place you can register to volunteer. And so we're encouraging all of you to, to absolutely visit. But if God would lead you, we need help with hosting, tear up and, and, and set up and uh, tear down. And so we'd love for you to come be a part of that. And we're looking forward to it. It's going to be great. We're talking about being a supernatural church. We can want to be a big difference maker in this compassion experience. But if things don't change in our heart and life, there won't be any reason to have the compassion experience. You understand, without certain traits, there'd be no reason to have this event. You know, God's people can be presented with many ways to reach the world. We can be presented with ways to change our community. But if our heart is not right, if our heart is not ready, it does no good to be presented with these opportunities. Today, I, I want to preach a, another characteristic of what we mean when we talk about a supernatural church. We've been preaching about being a loving church. We preached about being a church of prayer, and now we come to another subject. But I want to just be honest with you. How many people here either have a teenager or have had teenagers in your home? Raise your hand for me. Okay, have you ever had that moment where you knew you had to have a conversation with your teenage kid, but you knew it was going to be awkward? Anybody here? 
and you dreaded, dreaded, dreaded talking to them about it. You know, one of the fatal flaws of parenting is because it is awkward, because it is difficult, what do most people do? They avoid it, and they pretend like it didn't happen, and they don't address it. And when they do that, the problem complete gets worse. Well, today, I'm not your parent, but I am your pastor. And I want to preach a message to me which is just awkward because I know, remember when I said, if you're glad to be in church, say amen? That might be the last one I get in the sermon. And it's always awkward when you're up here preaching your heart off and it's just dead and quiet in here because the message is convicting and the message is difficult. But I want to preach to you about something that Jesus was and we must be. You know, in Jesus' life, I cannot find anywhere where Jesus ever sold anything. Can anybody remember if you find that? Anybody? But you know what I do find? Jesus gave away everything. When he had to fed the 5,000, what was the price of that meal? We're going to take up a love offering after the meal. We're going to pass the basket around. Was that how it was? No. See, it's done got quiet because I'm talking about giving stuff away. You, you understand that Jesus' life was a continual giving of himself. He healed people. He ministered to people. He gave his time to those people. He did things for those people. And friend, understand this, that even in his death, somebody else took his clothes. They gambled over them, and they took his clothing. Jesus had nothing his entire life, and the whole time he lived, guess what he did? He gave away what he did have. And today I want to come to you with a message that will be awkward for some and difficult for others, but I want you to understand this, that I want to preach that if the church must be a generous church, if we will ever be a supernatural church. Now, I know your first thought is, preacher, you're going to preach on giving. I want you to know right now, I don't want your money. I don't need your money. The church doesn't need your money. We're not trying to get anything from you. So just put that aside and understand today that there are some things that God can do in a people when their spirit is generous and their heart is willing to give away more than they ever acquire. Take your Bible and look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9 with me, will you? 2 Corinthians chapter 9, this is a letter being written by the Apostle Paul. He's writing a letter to a church in a place called Corinth. Now, Corinth, you wouldn't know where it's at. Like, you couldn't open up a map probably and go, oh, there's Corinth. Everybody talks about that place. But I want you to picture a place that's super pagan. Now, picture wherever that is, a place in the world where Jesus Christ is not really recognized. Can you do that in your mind? I mean, picture a place where they're still carving out gods out of tree stumps, and they're still worshiping the volcano god or the moon god or the sun god find that place in your mind you picture in that now now i want you to understand that that's where corinth was when paul got there and paul began to preach about jesus and people began to get saved and lives began to get changed then they said well what do we do now paul and he said well you get a church together and you start a church and you have a preacher and the preacher preaches to you out of the word of god and man you serve the community and you reach the community that's where he's at and paul is writing them a letter and he's telling them some things that they need to know about being a Christian. And one of the things that he is convinced that they need to know is that in order to be a Christian, you must be a generous person if you're to be Christ-like. A generous person if you're to be Christ-like. Now, read with me in your iPad or phone or Bible or on the screen. We're going to read verses 6 through 11. Please don't have a panic attack and a heart attack before we get the message going. I would say it's going to get better, but it probably won't. That's funny, y'all. It's supposed to be funny. Y'all okay? Everybody all right? All right, look at verse 6 with me. Paul says this. Paul says, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. He which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposed in his heart, so let him give not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye, always having all sufficiency at all things, may abound to every good work. As it is written, he hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your fruit, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causeth through us thanksgiving to God. 
Let's pray. Father, we come to you. And God, we help, pray that you'll help us as we preach this morning. God, I pray that you would give us a burden, God, to become a generous people. God, that our goal and our purpose in life would be to be generous, to give away. Lord, to help, to plant, and to sow. Lord, we love you today. And God, we pray that you'd help us as we continue to strive and want to be a supernatural church. Help us, God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I want you to see some things through verses 9 through 6, or, or 6 through 11, and I want you, if you take notes, to write down these things as we go along, because I want you to be able to go back and be able to examine these thoughts, and so you write them down as we get there. I want you to notice, first of all, the principle that Paul gives us. Paul gives us a principle, and let me show you the principle. It's really simple. It's not that hard. Notice what the principle is. He that soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, but he... Uh, uh, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Now, now, what does that look like? What's that principle? Here's the principle. If you plant something in the ground, what's going to happen? It's going to grow. How many people here raise tomato plants? Raise your hand if you raise tomato. Right, high, real high, real high. I didn't get any from half of y'all. What's wrong with y'all this year? Listen, when you, when, you, when you plant a tomato plant, you put a seed in the ground, right? And you don't know what's going down there, Barry. You put water on it, you cover it up, you can't see the seed. What are you doing? You're hoping what's going to happen. A tomato plant's going to pop up. Why? Because you just like greenery in your yard? No, you're excited because over here on this side, what is it? Mater sandwiches. That's what it is, right? You're, you're looking forward to the day that you can walk back out there, pull tomatoes off that, mayonnaise the bread and put some uh, tomatoes on there can I get an amen that's what you're hoping for right but let me ask you this how many people plant a garden and plant one tomato plant you don't do you why you don't get a lot of tomatoes all you do is you plant one to one one plant how many tomatoes you gonna get out of that not that many how many you plant a bunch of them why you want a bunch of tomatoes how about corn anybody ever seen corn grow you know, you ever notice that when you take the corn off the tree or what do you call that? Stalk. When you take it off the tree. <laughs> it's my corn tree. When you take the corn off of there, guess what? It's done growing corn, right? So if you planted one stalk, how much corn are you going to get? Very little. Man, what do you ever, you go down a cornfield, what do you see? You see rows of corn and rows of corn, so you can go out there and pluck all you want. The principle is simple. Whatever you put in the ground, that's what's going to grow. And the more you plant, guess what? The more you grow. Everybody with me? How hard is that in our life? The more you put in, the more you get out. The more you give away, the more you get. Is that an easy principle? It is, isn't it? It's pretty easy. But you know what makes it hard on us? Can I tell you what makes it hard on us? TV preachers. Yeah, it is, isn't it? You know what makes it hard on me for me preaching this right now? TV preachers. TV preacher gets on TV. He's got his Rolex on, his diamond ring, and he says, listen, I need you to send me $1,000. Now, I want you to get this today. There's nothing wrong with investing $1,000 into the kingdom of God. But when you use that word, me, that's where the problem occurred, isn't it? You understand that the principle is the same. If you give, God will bless. Everybody with me? No, you're not. Let me show you something else. Jesus, when he was here on the earth, in Luke chapter 6, he made this statement. He says, Given it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down and shaken together. Watch this. Running over. Now, here's a principle y'all can't grasp. The more you give away, the more God will bless you. You're saying, Preacher, are you talking about tithing? Look, I'm not talking about tithing. I'm talking about your life. The more you give away of you, the more God will give back to you. I'm talking about when your life becomes a life of generosity where you're saying, who can I help? Where can I help? What can I do? God said he will not only give it back to you, but he will give it back to you bountifully. Is everybody with me? Why is that so hard for us to grasp? Because we don't believe God will do it. I want you to know this today, that the principle that America teaches is what? Keep Grab hold on and hold on to, and if somebody needs, you know what they need? They need a job. That's what they need. Isn't that the way we think? But what does the Bible say? Give it away, and you'll get it back. It's hard to preach this in here, isn't it? Some of you in here are so tight. You go to lunch with your friend. They accidentally put the check together, and you're like, excuse me, excuse me. I need this split up. 
And by the way, I did not order the fried green beans. They did. And then you want to give them some measly little baby tip on there as little bit as you can because you're so tight. Let me say this. If you go to Liberty Baptist Church and you go eat today, I don't care if the food's the worst food you ever ate and the service is, is terrible. You better give 20% or don't even tell them you go to my church. You hear me? Because I'm telling you right now, God's given it to you. Give it to them. Give it away. You say, well, preacher, they got to earn it. That, yeah, that's what the world teaches. That's not what God teaches. God says, give it away. Be a blessing. Man, I'll tell you what some of y'all need to do. You just need to buy somebody lunch sometime. Get off some of that old money y'all toting around. You see, preacher, I mean, you give it away. I mean, give it away. But preacher, if I give it away, I won't have it. Listen, God said he will give it back. I want you to know that the more generous you are, the more you give away, the more you plant, the more you'll reap. You know, Jesus made several statements. He said, you have not. Why? You ask not. We say, well, you ought to pray. He also says, give it away and I'll give it back. But not many of us want to grasp hold of that idea, do we? You understand that sometimes we want to claim what's comfortable because prayer seems to be one of those things we can do mystically in the corner. But when I actually have to pay for somebody's lunch, that's coming out of my wallet. And I can see that. I want to say this to you. The principle is easy. The problem's the TV preachers. They make my job harder than anything in the world. I've talked to more people. Preacher, the reason I go to church is some preacher in Texas did such and such. I said, you ain't even mad him. Why are you mad? Listen, I want you to know the principle is the same. This ain't going nowhere. I've got to move on. Look at verse 7. Verse 7. I want you to see the explanation of the principle. Paul breaks it down for us. You know what people do to me all the time is people come to me and they say, Preacher, I need you to tell me exactly how much I should give, when I should give, and who I should give it to. And I'm like, what are you talking about? They're like, I need a rule book. What they're looking for is a checkoff list. Like, okay, I need to know exactly how much I need to give. I need to know exactly who I need to give it to, and I need to know exactly when to do it so I can check it off. Okay, I did this, and I did this, and I did this. And friend, I want you to know this. That's not how giving works. That's not how generosity works. It's not a checklist of things that you just mark off your list and you do it because you got to and you do it because you have to and it's something that's required. That's not what giving is. That's not what being generous is. Notice what he says in verse 7. Every man according as he purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. I want you to notice, first of all, when Paul talks about being generous, in verse 7 he makes the statement, every man you know what every man means it means it must be personal your generosity must be personal don't ask me how much to give it's up to you is everybody with me don't ask me who to give it to because that's up to you friend I want you to know this and I want you to get this and understand this today that if we decide to give it must be a personal decision you will never become generous to your neighbor or your friends because I say so Everybody with me? The only way you'll become generous to your community is when you decide personally, I am going to do something. I am going to make a decision to serve somebody, give to somebody, sacrifice for somebody, give away my life to somebody. Until you make a personal decision to do that, guess what? It'll never happen. That's why half of us don't go to the gym, ain't it? Yeah. We've talked about it. We've thought about it. But we ain't made our mind up about it. And I want you to know that if you're going to live a generous life, you've got to decide. Paul says, every man. He's saying, look, Dusty Brackett, make a decision. It's on him. Notice the second thing he says. As he purposed in his heart. You understand that the amount that you give, the plan that you have for giving, it has to come from you. Somebody asked me this all the time, and, and this is, you'll get this. People say, preacher, what do you think about 10% giving? Is that what I have to give, 10%, right? And I said, oh, no, no, no. We, we, man, listen, there's no rule at liberty you can only give 10%. I mean, we'll take up 60 70 80%. We don't care. Sit 10% doesn't bother us. How many realize that that's an Old Testament principle? How many, anybody realize that? It's Old Testament, that's old school. So preacher, what should I give? What's God laid on your heart? I promise you what God's laid on your heart is not zero, Daniel. 
But I want you to know this, that it has nothing to do with some magical number. You understand that it's something that God has put inside of you, and you've got to have a plan to give. Sometimes people say, well, preacher, I make $1,000 a week, and it's just rough numbers. And, I, and 10% of that would be 100 bucks, and I don't have 100 bucks at the end of the week. And I get that. But I want to say this, sometimes people, because they feel like they can't meet the 10%, you know what they do? Huh? They don't give nothing. And you know what we should do? We should say, well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to the church app, and I'm going to set it up so it automatically comes out every week 10 bucks. And then in three weeks, I'm going to move it up to 15 And then maybe in six months, I'll go to $20, and I'll go to $40. And guess what? You'd get a whole lot more blessing out of that than giving zero. You understand that giving is an idea that God places on your heart. Now, some of you in here, you've been saved long enough, and your gratitude has grown. You understand that a generous, generous life is not a, it's not a destination but it's a place you're always headed to. You're never going to get there like, hey, I am now generous. You see, generosity is something that grows in your life and grows in your life and grows in your life. And friends, I want to say this to you. When it comes to making a difference here in a couple of weeks in our missions program, unless we purpose in our heart and decide to, it won't do any good to even have a mission. Talk about missions. You understand that we all say what things are important to us until it's time to do that. Friend, understand this. It must be deliberate and purposed in our hearts. But notice what else he says. Not only is it personal and not only is it deliberate, but the Bible says not grudgingly. Not grudgingly. It's called free will. There's no rule. It's called free will. How many people are with me tonight? You know what I'm talking about? Free will. You know, giving to God is not something that we do because we have to. You understand that giving to our community or helping our neighbor or reaching out to our friends or reaching out to our family, being a blessing in their life, that we don't do those things because we have to. You understand that it's not a rule that we have to. We should not be giving it grudgingly, but of a free will. It must be something that we want to do, not something that we have to do. How many people understand that principle? No, you don't. Ain't nobody in this room going, I can't wait to buy somebody something to eat. I can't wait to help my neighbor in his time of need. I can't wait to help my friend when he's down on his luck. I can't wait to reach out to that guy I've just met and do a, something nice for him. I can't wait to do it. You understand that it should not be something we feel that we have to do, but a generous life is a life that says, man, I get to help somebody today. That's what a generous life looks like. A generous life is somebody who is excited for the opportunity to help a child or to help a missionary or help a church ministry or help somebody in need or help a person that has a problem. It should be our desire and it ought to be our want to to do something for others. How many people remember the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000? The Bible said they had traveled a long way to hear Jesus preach. They'd come out to a desert place and they had gotten there. And they were sitting around, they were listening to Jesus preach. As far as we know, nobody says in the story, hey, I'm hungry. Nobody. But Jesus, being a kind and loving person, he said, I bet they're hungry. They've come a long way. They don't have any food around here. And they've walked all this way. We should feed them. He could have said, all right, guys, well, it was great meeting with you. Had a great time preaching with you. See y'all tomorrow. He said, no, no. I want to feed these people. You understand there should be a desire down on the inside, something that's not a have to, but something that is a want to. You see, Jesus' generous life was so generous that the Bible says that Jesus, as he walked to Calvary, although he was facing his death, the Bible says that Jesus counted it all joy to die for you and I. I want you to notice this, uh, this next part, though. This is the part that y'all need because I can see it on your face. For God loveth. A cheerful giver you know giving should be cheerful and if you don't give it cheerfully guess what you just ought to keep it if, if you if the offering plate comes by here in a little bit or the Girl Scouts come up to you in a little bit and say hey I want you to buy some cookies or so-and-so comes up and says hey can you help me out and you do it like this <sighs> here's your stinking $20 that's all I got if that's the way you give you know what you ought to do just keep it just keep it if you don't want to help somebody just keep it you tight what you Ebenezer screw just sit on it until it rots 
I, I promise you, you might as well just hold on to that forever because God don't want begrudging money. He don't want it. He don't want it. If you don't want to give it, he don't want it. It bothers some of you that $20 is laying on the floor right now. <laughs> you, you understand that this idea that, that giving should be cheerful. And if it doesn't bring you joy to give, don't give. Don't. Please don't. Because I'll be honest with you, God can do more with a little that's given with a cheerful and a, gra and a, and a gracious heart than he can ever do with millions of dollars given with, gr with grudges. See, God loves a cheerful, cheerful giver. And some of you need to smile because you're not looking cheerful right now. You understand that attitude is everything. That giving should be an excitement. That giving should be a privilege. Giving and being generous in our lives to help somebody in the community ought to be something that does something for everyone else and it ought to make a difference in their life. But I want to give you this third thing. The principle is, is clear. Plant, you will reap. And you'll reap more than you plant. A lot more. If you, reap, if you plant a bunch, you'll reap a bunch. The explanation is very simple. It's very simple. It is personal. It's deliberate. It's free will. It, 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 it's cheerful. But there's a promise involved with it. And I want you to notice this promise. I want you to get this first of all. Here's the way giving works. Here's the way a generous life works. When you give to somebody who's in need, you know what happens? That person's need gets met. Everybody with me? Right? That, that person's need, that's the first thing that happens. Their need gets met. And, and what a great thing that their need gets met. But, but here's the second thing that happens. Not only does their need get met, but the Bible says he gives back to you more than you gave away. Everybody with me? So here's how it works. That person gets and his need is met. The second thing that happens is you're over here and God gives it back to you and he gives more to you than you gave to that person. Everybody with me? But notice the last part of this verse, what it says, which causeth through us thanksgiving to God. But here's the most important part. That guy's need gets met. You get doubly blessed for giving, but who gets the glory? God gets the glory. You understand that when somebody gives to you and they meet your need, you don't necessarily thank them, although you do. But guess what? At night, before you go to bed, guess who you really thank? God. Let me tell you, these kids right here never, never meet you. You send them money. You help them out. They'll never say thank you to you. But before they go to bed at night, you know what they're going to say? Thank you, God. You, you understand that the people in the mission field who get reached because of your generosity and your generous life, when that preacher they've never met or they didn't know comes to their town and preaches a gospel message and they get saved, you know when they go and kneel down before they get in the bed at night, you know what they're saying? Thank you, God. You see, our generosity leads to the glory of God in our lives. And I know it works. I'll tell you how I know it works. I remember when I was a kid, before my dad got saved, we were poor people. We didn't have a lot. We didn't have much. We, we lived in a, a, a rough place, and, and we didn't even have a car when my dad got saved. But I want you to know this, man. There was a group of people down at Gospel Light Baptist Church that would hear through my grandmother. We didn't go to that church, but my daddy's mom went to that church. And they would hear that we were having a hard time in our house. And how many people remember those 1970s station wagons? You know what I'm talking about? Long as this front row right here. Had a, had a tailgate on the back of it. When you opened it, you needed like nine miles to get it up. Everybody know what I'm talking about? And I can remember those folks backing up in our driveway and opening that big old door. And in the back of that job, in the back of that station wagon from the front to the back would be food line paper sacks full of groceries. And listen, these were rich people. Man, we'd load those things in our house and we'd have banana popsicles in there. You know the kind with the two sticks? It's like you're stealing one, you get two popsicles. And they had Pop-Tarts in those bags. Name brand cereal in those bags. And you know what we realized in that moment? That man, those people loved us, but you know what? You know who we got the glory out of all that? We didn't really know those people and they really didn't know us. But let me say this, but because of a generous heart that God had put in them, that man, when, we, when my dad got saved, you know what church we stopped in? Gospel Light Baptist Church. And you know who we praised and you know who we thanked? We thanked God for reaching down in our lives. And when the heat ran out and there was no fuel, how many people know what I'm talking about when I say fuel? The older man stopped by the house. 
pair of overalls, knock on the door. Hey, Miss Burrell, I, I, I just brought some fuel oil by. I'm going to walk around back and put it in if that's all right. And they'd go around their back, put it up there. You know what they were doing? They were being generous in the name of Jesus Christ. You see, our generosity should be in the name of Jesus Christ. Everything we do good for someone, that, that hobo on the corner that you don't know whether or not he's legit or not, when you give him 10 bucks or 5 bucks or whatever you do in his life, you understand that when I give him that $5 or when I give him that $10, I don't give it to him because they necessarily deserve it. But I give it to him in the name of Christ and I give it to him because God's given to me and I know I don't deserve it and I know I shouldn't have it, but he's been good to me. And when I give away money, I give away things, when I give away time, I don't do it because people necessarily deserve it or because I'm somebody special, but I do it for Jesus Christ because I know that long term, he'll get the glory for everything that's done. And church, I want to say this to you. We're not preaching a message this morning so you'll give us money. Matter of fact, y'all think I'm preaching on tithing. Well, I'm not even preaching on tithing. I'm going to challenge y'all in a couple of weeks, so harsh. I'm just warming you up for it. I'm just trying to get you warmed up for our missions. I'm trying to get you warmed up so that you won't give me money and you won't give our church money, but you'll give money to missions to reach people all around the world. That's what I'm warming you up for. And I want you to get this and understand this today, that every dime that goes into this church and the ministries that reach out and all the things that happens here, every time you do that, and you do that in the name of Jesus Christ, understand this, that we may call, they don't call me up and say, hey, preacher, I was down here at your church and this happened, or we were over at this ministry of your church and this happened. Thank you. They don't do that. But I know this. I know that at night they lay in their beds and they thank God for the ministries of Liberty Baptist Church. And I want you to know that everything that's done, both time and money, and resource in the name of Jesus it will never ever be lost to God's memory and it will be blessed forever and he will use it and work in lives and it will never ever be forgotten church how many people realize that everything we do on this earth is temporary how many people I'm gonna go back and get my $20 because it might be the last I got but how many people realize what's this made out? What is this made out of? What? Somebody tell me. Paper. What's paper made out of? Trees. Really, what is this? It's just paper. It, everybody, what? What is it? It's paper. Now, how long does paper last? It's not that long. You understand that this is just paper. You understand that what we do for God last into eternity it lasts into eternity it's remembered and it makes eternal difference this makes no difference at all no difference at all and church I want to remind you and I want to challenge you be generous look for somebody to be a blessing to look for somebody to give some part of you whether it's financial resource oriented find some part of you to give away this week do something for somebody and remember to do it in Jesus name father we come to you today and God I ask you to help us as we preach Lord I pray God that you are help us as we as we we we, we li re remember what we've heard preached this morning God we we know Lord that you were generous in your example we're thankful God that you've always been generous with your grace and mercy Lord, I pray, God, that today you would challenge us to be generous in our lives. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, no one's looking around. I'm not going to have an altar call today, but right where you're at in your chair, I want to challenge you with these thoughts. You've heard the principle that if you give, you'll receive, and you've known how we should do that. The question is, do we trust God enough to become generous with our whole lives? An old preacher told me a long time ago, he said, the reason God doesn't have our pocketbooks and our wallets is because he doesn't have our heart. You understand, if God has our heart, he's in control of everything else. All God wants from you is everything. And right where you're at, I ask you to just consider, ask God to help you have a generous heart. God would help you to soften that American dream of have and experience everything 
to give away everything and to help others when the opportunity arises. It's my desire that our church will become the most generous church, not in York, not in York County, but in all of South Carolina. We'd be the place that gave away more, did more, thought of people more. Father, I come to you today and I ask you, Lord, touch my people's hearts. Help us to become the most generous of the most generous. Help us, Lord, that there'd be none that gave more, did more, thought more of other people than we do. God, prepare our hearts for the great things that I know you have prepared for us here at Liberty. God, prepare our hearts to be ready to make the difference that we can, not only in our area, but in the world, God. God, deal with our hearts. Help us, I pray. In Jesus' name.